Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Canadian webcast series part three, ICS defense. It's not a copy paste from an IT playbook and importance of intrusion detection in a compromised prone world. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Dean Parsons and Nick Aline, both are SANS instructors. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Dean. All right, thanks, Carol. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad everybody could join today. Uh, as mentioned, uh, today's is going to be a two-part. Uh, the first is myself presenting on industrial control system defense. And then Nick is up shortly after with the importance of intrusion detection in a compromised prone world. Also, next week on the 15th, we have uh, additional content. Troy is going to be presenting on protecting data in a multi-cloud environment. And then Adrian will be presenting on pen testing modern web applications. I just wanna throw a note out here as well, some upcoming opportunities for SANS events in Canada. In, uh, in April, right through August, we have many upcoming events. So we have Jonathan doing SEC 560. We have Nick doing uh, SEC 504. And in June, we have John, uh, John and Stephen doing 555. And later on in August, the summer in BC, we have Stephen doing 511. Also, another note for later on this month, we do have additional uh, training coming up, specifically to industrial control systems. The ICS Summit 2018 Summit is on the 19th and 20th of this month. That's immediately followed by uh, training sessions specific to ICS from the 21st to the 26th, and that's gonna take place in Orlando. All right, so we'll jump right in. ICS defense, uh, the question we really wanna ask ourselves and try to answer today is can you take IT defenses and IT security and kind of like paste it into an industrial control system world to have, uh, to have you know, suitable defense and value. So we'll get down to that. So we'll break it quickly in three different sections of the talk. One is really considerations we'll have to look at if we want to try to attempt taking things from the IT security world and putting it in the ICS. We'll talk briefly on some major public incidents and access for ICS over the years. Uh, I probably will say the S word a couple times, Stuxnet, but we'll move on past that to more, more recent events as well. And we'll talk about specific ICS defense, what works in that arena and what doesn't. So today I wanna to talk about industrial control systems, but really in the context of critical infrastructure. So today we're gonna to talk really about these services and these critical applications that kind of underpin our modern society. So some examples of ICS in critical infrastructure would be energy. So uh, things like the power grid, for example, critical manufacturing, wastewater systems, transportation systems, and, and such. So we'll briefly discuss what an impact is in the IT world and an impact in the industrial control system world. They are different, they have different impacts. Let's just kind of look at that for a moment. So in uh, the IT world, an incident could be something like a critical business application that could go unavailable due to a uh, cyber event or cyber incident. We could have data corruption or data loss in an IT environment as well. And that's not a good day. In the industrial control system environment, however, the impacts can be quite different. We could have an incident where the loss of control of the physical process or, or the manipulation of the physical process in critical infrastructure is compromised. So back to the slide a moment ago, if we have critical infrastructure losing the ability to view the process in uh, electrical grid, for example, that generates power and distributes power for heat and light, or losing the ability in critical manufacturing, uh, for example, on a plant assembly line floor, uh, those are some of the potential impacts there. But really, wanna, I want to focus on the last point here in the bottom right is really personnel safety concerns. In the industrial control system world, an impact could be personnel safety. So again, on the left, we have a potential IT incident, and that's not a good day if you have applications that are down, data loss, data breach, that's never, a, never a good time. 
in the industrial control system world, again, bringing it back to safety, an incident could really impact the safety of human beings. So there is quite a difference in impact there. So I want to just take a couple slides in a few moments to kind of go down through a lot of defenses we all know on the call. You know, everybody knows what some of these IT defenses are, and we're just going to kind of play those against uh, the ICS and how they're used. Let's first start off with antivirus endpoints. So that's been you know tried, true, and tested. We've been using it for years and decades in IT, and we've gone from signature-based um, endpoint protection uh, using AV to heuristics, behavioral-based. And typically in an IT environment, based on behavior, based on signatures, a threat is then quarantined. So in the ICS world, it's not so much quarantining a threat because we want to reduce false positives. So mostly what we see in the industrial control system environment, heuristics can be used to alert on a potential event of interest or an incident for further investigation, but also whitelisting is used. So it's, it's essentially allowing applications XYZ to run and only those applications to run. So if you're on a whitelist, an approved list, only the applications you need to run for the industrial control system environment will run. So again, reducing the risk of false positives, reducing the risk of industrial control system applications being stopped if they don't have to be stopped. So let's look at firewalls. Firewalls in the IT world, again, used for decades, huge value also huge value in the end ICS, but they're used for slightly different purposes, segmenting different things. In IT, you segment users with firewalls, you segment servers in different um, network segments based on the, the service it provides. In the industrial control system, you have less users, and it's also to segment the business from the industrial control system, and also the internet from the industrial control system as well. We'll move along to network protection, network defense. So most folks have, uh, understand what an IDS is and an IPS. In an IT world, an IPS prevention system is used and has been very, very effective over the years, where it's actually actively dropping traffic or malicious network patterns. And it's been accepted very well in the IT world, low false positives, very effective. In the industrial control system environment, it's more helpful or useful uh, to see an intrusion detection system, where again, safety is a priority in industrial control system environment. We wanna make sure we don't drop any packets that are required for the physical process. Safety always wins in industrial control systems, and that makes sense. Prioritization is on safety of people. So detection of a potential threat or an incident in an ICS, that's suitable. What we can do after we detect a potential anomaly or a threat, we kick off incident response or at least some kind of investigation where humans would actually go investigate rather than leaving that um, determination and triage to a system to potentially take down part of the ICS control system. Vulnerability scanning. I've seen vulnerability scanning used heavily and very, very well in IT environments for years. And that makes a lot of sense. Even having an automated, so picture this, right? Having vulnerability scanning set up automated run, monthly, weekly, quarterly, you get reports on your critical servers to understand the risk surface in that area in your IT environment. Suitable, no problem, that's awesome, it works, very valuable, we've done it for years, we're gonna continue doing it. Even penetration testing as well in IT is somewhat acceptable. If you take vulnerability scanning and penetration testing in industrial control systems, yes, it can be done, but you need to use caution. Especially with legacy systems, vulnerability scans can be intense, network scans, penetration testing obviously can be intrusive as well. So we don't want to play around with the idea of potentially taking down industrial control systems, again, where safety is a priority. Both scanning and penetration testing can be done in ICS, but it's heavily advised to do it during maintenance windows and test previously in a development environment before that happens. This is mostly due to legacy systems that potentially in an ICS environment that may not be able to handle or may not be designed to handle aggressive scanning. So, but I will say that vendors over time and even recently in the past two to three years have been doing significant work in the area of industrial control system devices and hardening them, making sure they're more robust than you know, days of the past. So we've come a long way. The vendors have done a lot of work in that area for specific ICS components, such as PLCs, program logic controllers, and other devices found in ICS. But again, these types of scanning or testing should be done with care, tested in a development environment, and preferably during maintenance windows in industrial control environments. 
So patching, so I love this one, right? Everybody's aware that you know patching monthly is a great idea, and in IT that's more acceptable, um, and that's fine. So everybody knows what Patch Tuesday is. So in industrial control systems, patching is not as common uh, as it is in the IT world, but it's becoming more common. And things like NERC and NERC SIP compliance, specifically for electric utilities in critical infrastructure, it's a requirement to deal with patching, to manage it in a certain way, specifically to identify what patches are out there and within 35 days have a plan to mitigate or in install patches or to use comp compensating controls uh, to satisfy NERC requirements. So it's becoming more and more accepted in, in parts of the industrial control system environment. And again, this is another area that vendors are actually doing a lot of work patching and testing their systems with latest patches for Windows systems, running human machine interfaces to control the physical processes, and also in PLCs and things, the end devices that control the, uh, the physical world components. So again, keep in the back of your mind today for the next few moments, uh, can we take IT defenses and IT incident response and paste it into industrial control systems? So far, not quite, but we can change things, adapt them from the IT world that's been a really strong, um, you know, has, has a strong background in defense uh, in, in security and, and kind of adapt that to ICS. The same applies to incident response. So I'm reminded of a quote from uh, the Department of Homeland Security here where they, where they say essentially, if you do this, if you copy paste or take IT response, incident response, and push that into an ICS environment, you could have dangerous, ineffective, and disastrous results. You need to use caution. So everybody is aware of this, probably the usual incident response guide from you know, the IT kind of framework that everybody's been using for quite some time. That works, but you have to actually put hard hats in every every cycle we have here, right, from preparation right to post-incident. So that's what these hard hats represent. Another reminder that you can leverage the excellent track record from IT incident response in ICS, but you have to understand the nuance between each cycle. You have to always prioritize and consider safety of human beings and the, maintain the reliability of operations. So I want to break out a couple of quick points on IT and OT convergence that you may have heard over the past couple of years. It's still a kind of a, a somewhat of a heated debate um, where you have IT skills and OT skills, which is information technology and operation technology plant uh, skills and operators and engineers coming together to kind of marry up for one kind of team that can work together for effective cyber incident response and cybersecurity. So what I found to help this convergence, to help the IT folks and, and that camp and the OT camp kind of to, to work together is really site, site visits. So in my experience, actually visiting some of our industrial control system sites where you see the physical processes kind of work and understand the day-to-day -day operations is really impactful to the IT folks that may not be in the field often. And vice versa, the OT folks get an understanding of what kind of security risks are there in general, what kind of adversaries are at play, and how the vectors kind of are aligned for the adversary to potentially make their way in to disrupt the ICS process. So in general, face-to-face -face communications, face-to-face -face discussions with IT and OT folks at site is, uh, in my experience, has been a huge, huge uh, beneficial kind of component to marry these two together. When you're on site, you have a really good opportunity to have these discussions uh, and really ask the questions, hey guys, hey girls, you know, in this plant here, what keeps you up at night, right? What the, what's the main kind of things that you, that you see that could be at risk here from an IT point of view? And, and in, in that discussion, you can kind of find out a lot of, of things that may not be written down on paper. For example, things that may have been implemented in a plant can shake out to something different in the real world after it was implemented. So again, face-to-face on-site discussions has been very effective in my experience. So we'll move quickly to some public ICS incidents and access. So I did mention, I will say the S word, here it is again, Stuxnet. Hopefully mo most folks uh, know about Stuxnet today. If not, there's a lot of information out there about that. But what I wanna point out about Stuxnet and the other few I'll mention in the top right corner of this chart here, is that these specific tailored ICS attacks have high impact. And what I mean by that is actually have loss of view or reliability or safety concerns and, and potentially have, uh, in some cases they have, 
taken down and disrupted physical infrastructure. So physical assets have been potentially destroyed as well. So Stuxnet we talked about briefly. I'll go back to 2015 for a moment there, talked about the Ukraine power outage, which 2015, December 23rd, marks the first uh, reported case in the world of a cyber attack actually causing a power outage where there was uh, several customers, uh, you know, 200, uh, 225,000 customers in the dark for over six hours. So significant time there, significant event. And it happens very similarly in 2016 in Ukraine as well in December, but the adversary have improved some of their tactics because in 2016 with something called crash override, a new framework has been developed. And what that means is the framework is a lot easier to deploy and target in this case, specifically industrial control systems in the energy sector and electricity sector. So crash override, Stuxnet, I'll talk about traces. Uh, traces right at the top here, again, over in the top right-hand corner, uh, loss of safety, reliability of assets, so again, a heavy, heavy hitter in the ICS space. Traces is designed specifically to target industrial control systems and have been effective in actually targeting and taking down or disrupting the safety components of an industrial control system. So in my view here and the community's view, really, Traces marks kind of like a line in the sand where the adversary is really saying, you know, I have, or the adversary has no concern for human safety. These systems are designed, safety systems are designed to make sure that plants run safely. These back out systems, I'll call it, or safety net systems are designed to make sure if the physical process is disrupted, safety can win and safety can uh, protect personnel on the floor. So those are a few types of ICS instance that we've been seeing over the last number of years. There's been others as well in the stage ones. So in the middle of the graph, you have Habit, uh, which is, uh, came out in around 2013, 2014 is when we see an ICS, ICS specific module targeting industrial control systems. And that was, did not have any kind of uh, intent uh, to, to do disruption of the ICS, but it had more of the intent to map out the industrial control system, to do reconnaissance and get an understanding of what the industrial control system does. Uh, and kind of like go back uh, to the adversary to additional information. So we just talked about industrial control system targeted attacks and targeted events. I'll talk quickly about this. This here is the first reported crypto mining event in industrial control system. And what's really important here to note is that it was a water utility that actually reported the event. It occurred in January, but it was reported in February. And what this is, is an ICS that had IT malware on it. And from the reports we're seeing from the event, IT malware as it is, actually does still have an impact in ICS. So when we get to a couple of slides later on and I talk about industrial control system defense, I want you to keep in the back of your mind, obviously we're trying to defend against ICS specific targeted attacks. But the approach of using uh, ACDC, I'll get to in a moment, that that strategy for ICS defense also will fend off and neutralize IT threats as well. So again, we have a utility here compromised with IT malware, but still had an impact to the ICS. Specifically, quote, servers in the SCADA environment underpowered. So again, impact. So this quote here is kind of, I'll say, interesting. Uh, this came from the story as well. And really, um, this, well, the quote indicates that systems in the in, in the ICS network, sensitive HMIs, human machine interfaces, and the SCADA applications to run, monitor, control the industrial control systems are, quote unquote, always vulnerable to malware attacks. So I, I disagree with that, and here's why. Any vulnerability that you have, you can potentially implement compensating controls, et cetera. And here are a few things we've talked about earlier, highlighted in green, that indicates what can be done moving forward, potentially could have been done in this particular case. I didn't do incident response on this case, but going from what's publicly available, it seems like these things marked in green could have been helpful or at least helpful moving forward in this particular case. So again, we have antivirus, so heuristics alerting and whitelisting. The whitelisting was at play here. It's, it's lower chance that this IT malware could have been effective in its purpose and the adversary might not have gotten a foothold in the industrial control system. So again, AV whitelisting could be helpful. Firewalls as well, the way I understand the event, there was direct access from the internet to, uh, sorry, to the internet from the industrial control systems, specifically the HMI, the system that actually controls the physical process. In this case, it was a water utility. 
segmentation and firewall rules could be used to prevent that from happening as well to preserve the safety and reliability of operations. Also patching. So up in the quote, it really mentions latest Windows antivirus updates are important. That's obvious. Uh, but sometimes ICS systems cannot get access to those updates. I will say it's challenging to get access, but whitelisting, for example, for endpoints does not require updates frequently at all, if any. So that's another option for protection and defense there. So patching is definitely possible in ICS. We've seen that. There's some requirements out there, compliance requirements. But I will say this at the bottom of the screen. If there's a patch that comes out, it's not necessarily you have to deploy that patch. Obviously, you want to make sure if you're affected by the patch. So that's what I mean by, you know, the threat that you have is really comprised of any capability, opportunity, and intent. Patch comes out and you're not directly, um, it's not directly applicable to you. You don't have to roll it. So be smart about how we patch these systems. So here we are, ICS after defense, right? So IT, we have a uh, great history in, 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 in defense, a great number of common controls, and we have IT, uh, well, actually, sorry, ICS specific uh, targeted attacks, and we have different outcomes in IT and ICS. So what do we do about this? How do we get a good understanding, and how do we get effective measurable defense in industrial control systems? Is it possible? Spoiler alert, absolutely. Right, so this is where we enter the active cyber defense cycle, ACDC, not the band. Uh, it's a strategic model really used to be effective in understanding what is normal in your industrial control system environment and what is not. So what's normal and investigate what's not. This cycle is continuous just as the adversary's attacks are continuous. And we have to have dedicated resources that understand not only the IT, but the OT side of, uh, of both operations. So I don't really call it IT and OT much anymore. I actually just refer to it mostly as industrial control system security. I expect that in an industrial control system security environment, resources in that environment doing security, incident response, data acquisition, et cetera, have an understanding of both IT and OT. That's really where we're gonna get the most effective um, cybersecurity program to support the safety and liability of operations. So again, dedicated resources that understand both IT and OT, to look at the network very regularly, daily, uh, to know what's normal for the environment and investigate what's not. So we are talking specifically about ICS, active defense here, but we can't ignore the business side either. The IT network is becoming more of a target, um, and we've seen that as a vector into the industrial control system. So that happened specifically with the Ukraine event, where the IT network was uh, was the vector um, first, and then from the IT network, the adversary moved laterally through the network and then jumped to ICS. So again, while we're doing ICS defense, we can't ignore the IT business network either. Potential stage one IT attacks can originate from IT. So I love this next bullet, so, so just bear with me for a second, right? Opportunity in ICS over IT. Here's what's amazing about the, the, the situation that we're in as ICS defenders today. We have less users on the ICS network. And what that means is there's a lot less traffic, there's a lot less change. Environments in ICS are more static and more control changes as well. So what that means is it's easier to spot evil in the network. It's easier to spot evil uh, on workstations, endpoints, et cetera. It's easier to understand normal. So, so there's a huge opportunity there, and it's, it's, it's a rare opportunity to say that we may actually have, uh, we might actually be one step further in a lot of cases than the adversary. We have the knowledge in the IT and the OT. That convergence allows us to have an understanding of our processes, which is unique. And having that ability is extremely uh, important because we know that, we have that. The adversary has to learn that to try to build their attack. All right, so I just want to do a recap here quickly. Industrial control system defense takeaway. What we know from the slide deck is really IT has been doing security for a very, very long time. IT and industrial control system threats are there. Uh, and, and IT malware can infect and impact ICS. In ICS, we can leverage what IT has been doing for years. We have to have that nuance of safety first every time we look at an ICS. That makes sense. Embrace OT and IT. That is, in my opinion, the best way forward. Take the best of both worlds, meld that together, not in IT or OT as like a fight or a versus kind of like scenario. Marry that into ICS cybersecurity to, for the most effective data acquisition, incident response, and defense. As mentioned earlier as well, 
with the IT malware on a utility. Uh, we have active cyber defense cycle really can neutralize IT and ICS uh, threats. So that's kind of the crux of the conversation. But if you want to learn more about this, I will say that ICS 515, that course specifically, Active Defense and Incident Response, the uh, associated GRIS certification, will provide a lot more information and insight on that for you. Also, pretty excited about this. This is a brand new certification that's been released as well, uh, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, GSIP. This is a certification for critical infrastructure protection. So anybody out there who has to comply with NERC or NERC SIP compliance, this is a great class for you to take. And also there's a huge community that's growing in the ICS area. And we talk about a lot of things in ICS on this specific forum here. So ICS-community.fans.org, drop by, participate, ask some questions. And I'm sure there's a lot of folks that will provide some good answers. I do want to thank you for your time. If there are any questions, you can type them into the uh, question box. Uh, if not, that's totally cool as well. There's my credentials and also how to get a hold of me. I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions on this material or something else SANS related that I could help with with ICS. All right. Thanks, Dean, for that great presentation. We did have a question come in. Uh, since applying a patch to an ICS is difficult, where do you see network-based virtual patching fitting into ICS cybersecurity? For example, devices that can block or sense vulnerabilities. Right, so if I understand the question, I believe that patching is definitely, uh, there's an opportunity for patching, but I'm also seeing that compensating controls can be used as well. So if patching is not available or not possible, and an example of that would be, um, off the top of my head, at electric utility in the middle of winter time in sub-zero sub temperature look in Canada, patching is not available. If the system cannot take an outage, then compensated controls could be used and then a change window could be uh, allocated perhaps in spring, literally, uh, when the system could take, uh, take, a, take an additional downtime. All right, thank you. Uh, has there been an uptick in vendors making upgrades and patches available over the last 10 years? Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. So in, in two areas, one for patching and also one for hardening devices. So I've, I, so I have a small lab. I have a couple of chats with the PLCs here. And what I've been doing uh, over time is actually doing penetration tests on these PLCs. So what I've learned in doing these exercises is older firmware versions, even as, as recent, I'll say, as five years ago, four years ago, are vulnerable to things like Christmas tree attacks, so NMAP scans, aggressive scans. So over time, we're definitely seeing new firmware versions from many PLC vendors hardening the devices, hardening the protocols and understanding what, uh, what risks there are with, uh, um, with, with scanning and actually you know, preventing scanning from tipping the boxes over. So in general, firmware and vendors are getting more improved to handle security, uh, but also with patching specifically. I mean, as there's several vendors right now that have patching, uh, I guess, websites, portals, where you can go uh, a couple days after Microsoft releases their patches. For example, uh, a vendor in the, PL, in the PLC area or uh, HMI arena will say, you know what, we've seen this patch that Microsoft has put out We've tested it with our systems, and we verify that it should be okay with this version of your PLC software or this version of your HMI. So to answer your question in short, absolutely. We're definitely seeing advances from the vendor side in both the patching and also the network hardening, I'll call it point of view for sure. All right, thank you. Uh, that's all the questions we have for you. However, if some do come in, um, Dean, I'm sure we can address them later. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Nick. Thank you. Nick, I'll stay on and verify that we can see your screen. All right, looks good. Okay, can you guys hear me clearly? Yes. Awesome. Good job, Dean. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the other half of this session. My name is Nick Allen and I'll be presenting on the importance of intrusion detection in a compromise-prone world. As Carol mentioned, I currently teach a science SEC 503, which is the intrusion detection in, depth, um, detection in depth class, as well as the SEC 504, which is the incident handling hacker techniques and exploits. I also blog at securitynick.blogspot.com, 
and I'm currently a Senior Manager Cybersecurity at Foresight Technology Canada. So here's a quick overview of what we will be touching on today. So the most important thing for this presentation is why does this matter? Right. We'll go through exactly why does it matter. We'll look at things from the assumption that we're living in a assumed breach world where it's not a case of when I'll be compromised, it's whether or not you're already compromised. If you'll be compromised, definitely not. Once again, you're more than likely already are compromised. You might not know it because you might not have been do any type, doing any type of intrusion detection or analysis or anything like that. We'll try to figure out where we should start. We'll try to understand what we already have. And once we figure those things out, we'll also try to look at what the budget allows us to do. As we go through, we'll recognize that this should be easy, but this is gonna be dependent on what we have versus what we don't. And if we don't have some of these things, then obviously it's gonna become a lot more difficult than it should be. One key takeaway also is going to be the importance of time as it relates to intrusion detection. Because as we talk about time, we have to figure out the time to detection, time to remediation, and all these different things. So let's move on. So why does this matter? According to uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, cybercrime in 2016 had a value of 600 billion US dollars. Now this is up from 2014, where it was 500 billion dollars. According to risk-based security, 2017 was considered the worst year on record for cybercrime breaches or for, for cyber attacks. 5,200 breaches reported, and this is up 24.1% from 2016. At the same time, 7.89 billion records were exposed. Once again, this is up from 2016. Now, if you think about this, the world's population is just about 7.6 billion or something like that, they, they claim. So with 7.89, if we were to look at it from that perspective, we can say almost every one of us have gotten compromised. At the same time, uh, risk-based security states that hacking was the responsible for 55.8% of all compromise. And when we talk about hacking here, we're talking about unauthorized intrusion. We're talking about compromise from outside versus the insider threat or something like that. So let's look at this from a picture perspective because they say picture tells a better story. And as we can see, 2017 definitely reflects the worst year. But this trend is nothing new. You can see from 2013 until 2016, basically the trend continues to go up. While there was a, a, a slight drop in 2016, the number still rose in, in 2017 in terms of the number of incidents. But look at the number of records that were exposed. Even though there were less incidents reported in 2016, there were way more records that were compromised or exposed in, in 2016. So as we can see, the trend continues to grow and the importance of intrusion detection becomes clearer because as we move forward to the future, this is gonna become even more important and these incidents are not going to more than likely reduce anytime soon. This data also covers various sectors. Um, be it you're the Ubers of the world or the Equifax, or uh, it covers uh, agriculture sector, banking, finance. Basically, it doesn't matter which sector you are, you are more than likely, if you haven't been compromised, will be soon. And this transitions us into the assumed breach world. So the objective is you should be operating as if you have already been compromised because the reality is, lots of times, organizations do not know that they are compromised until they start doing some type of hunting or some type of analysis on historical data. So if you haven't been compromised already, you probably will be soon. Or you may already be compromised, but you just don't know it. Okay? The reality is, health is here, and from the perspective of the SANS SEC 503, where we talk more about intrusion detection, this is exactly what we're trying to to teach everyone about. You know, we're focusing on the logs, on the packets. We try to understand things as they traverse the network. So where do we start if we intend to be able to detect these breaches, these compromises, these intrusions? The reality is with the amount of devices that we have on our network or our infrastructure, we cannot monitor everything. But what we have to do is focus on the critical assets. 
Think about it this way. The most important thing for the bank, or one of the most important things for the bank, is the vault. Every effort is made to protect that vault. So from the organization perspective, we should be making every effort to protect what we consider our critical assets. If you're in the fast food industry and you have a specific recipe, that would be your, your, your critical asset. If you are a, a web, let's say e-commerce provider, you have a set of data or something proprietary, that is your critical asset. So from an organization perspective, it is important that we understand what our critical assets are, and then we put the emphasis towards protecting those. But while I emphasize protection, the reality is with all the protection mechanisms we have in place, companies and organizations are still being compromised. So this is why the detection mechanisms become even more important. So monitor the vault. You know, have, we'll talk more about the logs and the packets later on, but ensure that your critical assets are being monitored from the perspective of the logs, the packets, any type of access or even attempt to access that data that might be in your vault. So we need logs, right? The logs tell the majority of the uh, story from the host perspective. So be that as your endpoint logs, your uh, server logs, your Windows logs, your application logs, whatever it is, it's gonna tell you the story from the host perspective, and that's gonna be critical. We need full packet capture. On most days, the packet doesn't lie. And I say most days because someone can actually craft a packet that might tell you something other than what you, you, you should be seeing. But ultimately, as you analyze that packet, you should also be able to conclude, well, this packet is trying to fool me. But the reality is, packets give excellent visibility. And obviously, we have to be concerned with uh, encryption and SSL and these type of things. But if you're doing some type of SSL decryption and you can now see into that payload, then it's clear that you will be able to see exactly what occurred uh, from the perspective of, of the payload in the packet. Now, the reality is also that many times you will not have full packet capture. This can be for a number of reasons. Maybe the organization just does not capture it. Um, maybe budget constraints, maybe compliance reasons. For whatever the purpose that the organization might not be capturing full packet, it's important that you understand that there are also facilities that are more likely in your network already that allows you to do that. But if you don't, then if you can capture flows, that can be an excellent substitute. So what am I talking about when I reference flows? Think about your phone bill. When you get your phone bill, your phone bill tells you who you call, when you call, the duration of the call, and so on. Think about flows from the similar perspective. The flows does not tell you exactly what was said or what was communicated, but it gives you, let's say, the metadata, the statistics. It tells you who you were talking to, when, and how long uh, you were speaking to them. This becomes very critical as you know, in the absence of, of full packet capture, because realistically, let's say we take an example that we use in the 503 class, where we talk about DNS communication. When you make a DNS query or a DNS lookup, that lookup probably take a second or just a few seconds. But if for some strange reason you're looking at your logs or your communication across, uh, let's say in the flows, and you look and you see there's a DNS session that spans about 50 minutes or 50 seconds, that would be a cause for concern. Because once again, as I said, on most days, your DNS communication is just, hey, give me google.com, and that comes back, and that's the end of that session. But realistically, you should not have a DNS session that lasts more than a few seconds. Okay? So by looking at the flows, we can definitely tell uh, you know, whether or not something is wrong. And the flows in, the, in themselves are very helpful in the absence of full packet captures. So, what do we have? The reality is from the logs perspective, we probably have way more than we need already. It's more than likely your organization has web servers. It's more than likely your organization has switches. It's more than likely you have an IPS or an IDS. You have maybe your unified communication systems, your databases, vulnerability scanners. All of these things are excellent sources of logs. The question now becomes is what are you doing with those logs? Okay. The recommended thing, obviously, would be that you forward in these logs after a centralized uh, logging solution, be that your SIM or a centralized syslog or some other solution. But these logs are already there, right? And once you have access to these logs, 
you can tell quite a story in terms of what transpired. The reality is though, if you're only collecting these logs and storing them on your local system, then you're gonna probably have more problems than you need if and or when you are compromised because an attacker can gain access to these logs and manipulate these logs. They can, in some cases, clear the logs. In some cases, they can insert bogus entries. The attacker might even be able to take the logs offline depending on the type of device, edit those logs, upload them back to your system and then have you seeing false information. So it's critical that when you have your logs, you forward those off to a centralized logging solution. That way, even if the attacker clears the log on the source host, then the original logs will still be on the, the centralized logging solution, providing that the attacker obviously did not gain access to that and thus did not compromise um, that solution also. But once again, it's more than likely you have tons of sources of logs in, in your environment already, and it's critical that we take advantage of those logs as they come in. A key component from here also is gonna be your authentication servers in terms of logging. Uh, I like to tell the people on my team is that it's not always about the latest malware. Lots of time people attempt to gain access to your environment and then they try to elevate those privileges. Ultimately, they would need credentials to be even, let's say to gain access via a malware, they more than likely need credentials to pivot throughout your network. So being able to track your authentication logs is also a critical component. And obviously your interaction, if you have a, a web presence, a web application firewalls also tells a very good story. Um, whilst we're gonna talk about the routers from the perspective of the flows, your router also has logs that you can leverage, right? Access to those devices, because realistically, if an attack gains access to your network infrastructure, he or she gains access to the router, he or she can then direct where the traffic should go. And that way can disrupt your entire organization. So we already understand that, you know, it's more than likely we have the logs in our environment, right? Tons of those already, just for us to figure out where to put them and how, and how to use them. But the reality is we more than likely also have the packets in our environment. Think about this you more than likely have one or more switches in your environment, okay? And if you do, then the easiest thing for you to do is span a port to get the full packet capture, right? Cheap storage, uh, you can probably get some consumer grade, let's say server or something like that, and you just configure it to just store the PCAPs. And if you were into intrusion detection, it's more than likely you would have used tools like T TCP dump or T Shark or something uh, similar. But even with TCP dump, it's relatively simple to just capture those packets and save them there for long term, depending on the amount of storage you have. For example, this TCP dump command I have here basically is going to write the packet out of file name security NIC and it's going to give it the file name as well as the date and the timestamp. And it's going to zip the file and rotate the file every 3600 seconds. Right? So this is basically what? Uh, five minutes or something like that? Uh, 3,600 seconds. So the point is here is that you already have all these facilities in, in, in your environment that you can leverage, right? It's not overly complicated to run TCP dump and just write these files out. And then if something does occur, let's say something occurred yesterday and TCP dump is running today, you can go back and unzip one of those files and then you can uh, run TCP dump against that data. But even before we move on to looking at the routers and the data they provide, once we have this full packet capture, there's tons of other things you can do with it. If you use tools like Bro, for example, you can now take the full packet capture and run that against Bro, and you can now generate ASCII-based logs that you can get very good insights into what is going on to your environment. You can even use tools like Silk or any other flow-based um, tool that you can use, um, PFSEN or, or, or NFSEN, sorry, not PFSEN. PFSEN is a firewall. But tools like NFSEN, NFDump, you know, those are all tools that can take full packet capture data and convert them into uh, flow data that you can now analyze. But even in the absence of not doing the, the, the span port, your routers you, you, you are already more than likely producing flow data. All you have to do is capture that, right? Put it on the flow collector and then you, you, you analyze that. Draw your conclusions. Your firewalls in some cases will also provide you this data, which ultimately can prove helpful. The reality is also 
by taking advantage of the existing switches, the existing routers, the existing firewalls, you're basically going to be maximizing on your existing investment, which means you ultimately get a higher return also on your investment in terms of, of what you can do. Okay. One of your bigger constraints also is going to be your budget. Budget is always a major concern when it comes to implementation of anything, intrusion detection, or any type of monitoring and or security tool. The reality is though, budget doesn't have to be a major concern, right? You need to focus on what, you, what your business needs. What are, what are your business priorities? Let's go back to what we stated earlier. The vault, protect the vault. What is it you need to protect that is priority from the business perspective? Once you clear on that, then your budget might not be as astronomical as you might think. It might not even, there might even not be, or there might not even be a need for a, a budget because you might be able to use open source tools. But then obviously that brings in another concern. Not every organization wishes to use open source tools. There are organizations that have policies against using open source tools. So if there's a policy against using open source tools, then the alternative has to be that you're using commercial or something um, homegrown. So office politics definitely will dictate your choices, but ultimately you need to settle on what's best for the business. I know myself personally as someone that loves technology, you know, sometimes you, you, you see a solution that you think can solve a problem. But once again, if the business does not think that's the best solution, then ultimately the business wins because at the end of the day, we're here to support the business. So as I stated earlier, this should be easy, right? If we step back to where we spoke about the logs and the packet, if we have those things, it should be easy, right? Yes, the argument could be that you know, we have a ton of data being pumped in. We have tons of packet captures coming in. We have um, tons of logs coming in. That's okay. But at least if you have that data, matters not how much of it is coming in, you can go back to it. Think about it this way. Most of the time when you're investigating an intrusion, you probably start with some type of trigger. What is that trigger? Did it come in from an IDS or IPS alert? Did one of your employee or your fellow colleagues tell you, hey, something is wrong with my computer? Did some one of those three-letter agencies call you and tell you that, hey, there's a problem here? Or did a user say, hey, you know what? I just accidentally clicked on this email and now I believe I've been fished. Whatever it is, the data is there and you can use that trigger as your starting point to now start digging deeper. So if you have the logs, you can use, let's say, for example, um, the user told you about an email and you're logging stuff from your email or you're logging full packet capture. You can search that full packet capture or the log and look for maybe where that attachment name shows up. And using that guidance, you can now start drilling down and going back to your data. Um, let's use the Equifax example. And even Yahoo, I mean, like, they started off where they found X amount of data was compromised. And as they went back, they recognized that more data was compromised. I think it's even up to last week or the week before, I think uh, Equifax reported that uh, an additional, I think it's 2 million or something like that, more records were found to be compromised. Whatever it is, it's not, the, the number is not important. But the fact is there was a trigger that they can now go back. And if they have the data, then they can tell the story. But if they don't, there's no story to tell. So. As I said to you, the reality is it can be easy, providing that you have the logs. If you have the packets or the flows, even better, more so on the packet side, because you can look into the packet and tell exactly what happened, exactly what was, the, was done, and try to replay that. Because the logs is not going to show you every single thing. But a combination of the logs on the packets can tell you an extremely uh, clear story that makes you draw clear conclusions and be able to put in recommendations to then protect your environment and prevent that from occurring in the future. Or if you are unable to prevent it from occurring in the future, to at least mitigate the risk or at least reduce the risk of the impact it may have in future circumstances. Uh, as I stated, you will catch most activity, if not all, with the logs on the packet. But it can also be difficult. You know, why can it be difficult? Well, if you have no logs, there's nothing to analyze. There's no conclusion to draw, right? You're gonna be operating blindly. If you don't have any packets, you are operating blindly. Now, if you don't have any logs, you don't have any packets, hopefully you have flows. And if you have one of those, you are in a position to give some insights into what occurred, 
But if you have all of those, you're in a bit, much better position. I want to say all. I'm speaking specifically of either the logs on the packets or the logs on the flows. It doesn't need to be logs, packet, flows. But don't get me wrong, logs, packets, and flows can all be helpful. Why? The problem with full packet capture is that you're not going to be able to, or you're unable to retain as much data as you like, probably because of storage requirements. But with the flows, you can store that for much longer. So one of your strategies might be, you know what, I'll keep full packet captures for 30 days, but I'll keep flows for maybe an entire year, right? But that is once again providing that you have that. But if you don't have it, once again, it's difficult. Um, you won't be able to know whether or not you have been compromised already, and you definitely will not know what to do. So I mentioned from the beginning that time is a critical factor, right? Time is extremely critical from the perspective of intrusion detection because when we talk about time, one of the first things we need to know is the time to detection. And when we talk about the time to detection here, let's give an example. Let's say an attacker compromised your network yesterday and you detected it today. That might be a 24 hours for time to detection. But then another piece of time is your time to remediation, right? How long it took you to actually address that problem. Now, working in different time zones can prove critical to your environment because you might have lock sources, lock sources that are coming in from one, organi uh, from one part of the world with one time zone and another part of the world with a different time zone. One of the good things about some of the monitoring tools or the logging tools is that they store two sets of time, or in some cases, three sets of time. But some of them store the time that the event actually arrived at the monitoring solution, as well as the time that was actually in the event log. And some of them also store the time that the information is written, let's say, to the database or to the file system, whatever. But you have to be able to find a way to ensure that all of those times synchronize. So if I got compromised in, let's say, in, in uh, in CST time zone and I'm in EST time, then that one hour difference should not have a significant impact in terms of me being able to detect what transpired. Another important thing to note is that from the time perspective, you should be using your NTP time server. Use at least two NTP servers and do not rely on your local computer time. Why? If you have two NTP servers and one dies or one fails, then you can alternatively switch to the second one. If you're using both local, NT, um, both local time and NTP server, then you have a problem. Consider this scenario. If you're using your cell phone for the time as well as you're wearing a watch, and the cell phone is getting its time from the provider network, and your time is being set manually on your watch, then you're going to have a problem. So the reality is the person with one watch knows the time. The person with multiple watches is not sure about the time. So from an intrusion detection perspective, you would like to ensure that all your times are synchronized because without that, you will have a problem detecting clearly and understanding exactly when the breach occurred and thus being able to calculate your time to detection and your time to remediation can have significant impact. So as we wrap this up, here's the takeaway for us today. If you're not doing it already, start doing it now or, considering a, or, or consider a way to get it done. You should be collecting and analyzing your log. It's just one thing to collect. But if you're not analyzing, then there's nothing for you to really learn. You, you should not wait until there's a compromise to go analyzing your log. I know individuals might say, but I have a SIM. Yes, the SIM is there to solve some problems. It's not there to solve all your problems. But then remember, in most cases, your SIM is going to be operating on some type of signature-based mechanism unless you're doing some type of an anomaly detection or user, user behavior or UEBA, as you call it now, user entity behavior analytics. But whatever it is, you know, to, 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 to ensure we're doing the best at intrusion detection, we should be collecting and analyzing those logs. Collect the full packet capture where possible. As I said, where possible, because it's clear, you know, that you might not always be able to collect full packet capture. It can be for compliance reasons, it can be for regulation, whatever. There might be um, inhibitions that might be preventing you from doing full packet capture. Alternatively, if you are unable to do full packet captures, collect flows where possible. Now, me, I personally prefer if you're collecting full packet capture because with that, not only can we run tools like TCP dump, Wireshark, and all these things, or T-Shark against this, but we can now literally run this, uh, run tools like such as Bro or Silk or so on against the full packet capture, and we can tell stories that we might not have been able to tell. Um, 
a lot of the tools I mentioned there, the bro, the silk, and the talking about full packet capture and logs, a lot of this we talk about in the SEC 503, where we go deeper into understanding intrusion detection. So realistically, if you, if you feel that you, know, you would like to learn a lot more about uh, the intrusion detection side of things, feel free to register for one of my upcoming classes uh, to learn more. And at that point, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Right. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, I see a question. Let's see here. Okay. No, nope, I'm sorry. That's a question for me. I'll have to answer. Um, I don't see any at this moment. Um, while we give everyone a chance to think, I'd like to let you know that you can find your CEUs for all completed webcasts by logging into your SANS portal account, navigate to your account dashboard, then click My Webcasts. You can then download your CEU on the right-hand side of the web page. And I think someone was just asking for a link for this uh, particular webcast uh, to view it in the archive. So let me put that in the chat window. And I haven't seen anything else come in. Um, do you, either of you have any closing thoughts? Uh, I would just like to thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Dean, go ahead. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I was just going to say, Nick, that was excellent. Uh, I think that, you know, all this talk about ICS and IT defense, I think we're on the right track and it's really good to have people, uh, you know, receive that information. I think we're, we're, we're doing good here. Yeah, absolutely agreed. And, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately, we're living in a world where compromise is, is just an everyday thing. And we're not going to get, we're not going to escape this anytime soon. So it's, it's, it's imperative upon us as defenders to be able to you know, understand what is it we're looking for and what is it we need. In most cases, we don't need much. Uh, if we have the logs and the packets, believe it or not, that is probably the majority, if not everything we need in most cases. And I'm not talking about whole space analysis or anything like that, but from the network perspective, the intrusion, someone breaking into our network. Once they break in, there has to be communication. And once they're communicating, we more than likely will see it on the network once the packet, uh, the packet capture is there. If the host that they're connected to is doing logging, between the packets and the logs, we can tell a lot of what happened. So if you're not doing that already, you know, do that. But as I said, unfortunately, we're living in a world that is compromise prone. So you know, let, let's do our best to try to detect the adversary sooner rather than later. Absolutely. All right, well, thank you so much, Dean and Nick, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.